Well, good morning. Good to have you here. And whether you're joining us in-house or online, we're so glad you've chosen to be with us today and worship the Lord together. I want to ask you a question. Just imagine for a minute that you are on a football team and you are on the offense and you're on the field and you're in a huddle and you know you're in the huddle and the quarterback is calling the play and he calls the play you've practiced the play you've run it a number of times and uh, he so he calls it out and and as he calls it out and you're ready to break the huddle somebody goes uh is that the best play to call and it was a running back and he goes i think we ought to run it we don't run enough and all of a sudden, there's a wide receiver, and the wide receiver goes, uh, we need to go long. We need to give a, a, down, a downfield threat. They don't feel, th we, we just, and so a debate breaks out in the huddle about what play to call. Everybody's arguing. All of a sudden, there's a whistle. Ah, there's a penalty. You've taken too much time. So you lose yardage. You step back. You come back into the huddle. This time, there's another debate. You know, these uniforms are brand new. They're clean. I don't want to get them all dirty. And other people are going, you know, the other team is kind of mean. And they're, they play dirty. I don't, think I, I don't think I like them very much. And then other people are going, I don't, I don't think we're ready. We need to practice a little bit more. We need to work out a little bit. Bip, another whistle, and then back again. Never happens on a football field. But it happens in the church all the time. Churches want to gather together in their holy huddles, but they don't want to break the huddle and get into the game. And, and that's kind of what we want to talk about this week. And for various reasons, Christians like to be in huddles. They like to be in their comfort zone with their people doing their things and doing religious stuff and studying the Bible and praying. All those things are important. But they never want to break the huddle and get into the game because the game is messy and people don't play fair. Bad things happen. Well, I want to talk about the early church because that's what we're talking about in Acts chapter 8. And basically, God is going to cause them to break the huddle. And it's a kind of an amazing passage. The last weekend, we talked about the stoning of Stephen. And I had like 80 verses. This week, I only have like five verses, so we should be done in about five minutes, right? <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. But I am, I am going to be reading from Acts chapter uh, 8. And I just want to read the first uh, four verses. See, this is even less than that, so we're going to be done in four minutes. Um, so one of the things, when you read through the, the Bible, uh, one of the things you need to know is the verse numbers were added later. And so sometimes what you'll find is the chapter divisions come at inappropriate times, not inappropriate, but inopportune times. In the middle of a thought, you have a, you know, you have a chapter division. This is what you have between, and it, the reason is, it's a really long chapter. I mean, Stephen's sermon goes on and on and on, and then there has to be a change, and there is kind of a change, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a difficult change. So look at uh, chapter 8. Verse 1, um, it says Saul approved of their killing him. And you go, well, what is he talking about? Well, you go to chapter 7 and the killing of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. It talks about Paul being a young man sitting there watching the coats. But it says he approved of their, uh, their, their killing him. And then it says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, I don't... I don't think that's saying everyone except the 12 apostles were there in Jerusalem. I think there were other Christians scattered throughout Jerusalem. I think what it's saying is there were a lot of Christians that had to leave town. They had to break the holy huddle. Now, let's go on. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. So Saul not only witnessed the stoning of Stephen, he participated in the persecution of the church. I mean, he really wanted to take the church down. He wanted to destroy the church, the early movement. And so he's going house to house. 
He's finding out whether there's followers of Jesus, followers of the way, Christians, and he's pulling them before the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. We know, too, if you read through, and we'll see this in a minute, that he not only is taking the, these people in Jerusalem, he's going out to other areas and he's finding people in other areas. So this is happening all over, and Paul is instrumental in all of this. This is going on, okay? Now notice what happens here. He sought to drag them out from their houses. Can you imagine what that must have been like? The fear? To be a follower of Jesus Christ, to go public, or even to be public with your faith at this point? This has got to be a scary time. So it says, so many fled Jerusalem become, and, they, be, and they, they became lights. They became light of the Gospels. Uh, and, and they became frontline preachers. You know, they didn't wait for the apostles to come before the Gospels preached. They began to preach the Gospel themselves. They were like you and me. They were ordinary people. Well, you say, Pastor, you're a preacher. Okay. They were like you, all right? <laughs> in a sense that I've had training and all that stuff. But they didn't wait for me. They just went out and they just kind of shared the gospel. So here's, there's really only two points that I want to share today. Here's the first one. We need to get out of our holy huddles and engage our world now. You and I need to get out of our holy huddles and we need to engage our world now. Um, look, at, look at what Paul, Peter writes. This is uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We love that, right? That's special. You, Peter's saying, you're special, and you are special, okay? But then he says this, you're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Notice that that, that word that means you were, you're this so that you could be that. You're this so that you can be that. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In other words, what Peter is saying is you're a special people, but you're not supposed to be special just around yourself. You're supposed to be special to the world around you need to get out of your huddle. Now, what did the early Christians do when they were persecuted? Remember, we talked about this last weekend. We said what happened was they were gathered in Jerusalem and they were waiting for the return of Jesus, but Jesus didn't come back. And so they thought, you know, so, you know, he's going to come back soon and he didn't. And so now Paul is, Saul, is now persecuting the Christians. And so he's saying, okay, so they're going, this is not good, and so they have to leave. They're forced to leave. And then uh, look at what happens. It says in, in the Acts passage we read, those who are scattered, they preach the word wherever they went. They wait for the apostles. They carried the good news themselves wherever they went. They, they were running for their very lives. And they didn't leave to go, okay, let's gather together, let's hide here. They were just very public and very bold in their faith, wherever they went. They just lived their faith day, day by day. They, 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 um, they didn't gather for a new holy huddle. They were, re, they were out and about. Um, no, it's interesting to me. Let me read you Acts 1.8. And I think Acts 1.8 is kind of an overview of the whole book of Acts. It, it basically, Jesus telling the disciples for, before he ascends into heaven, this is what I want the church to do, okay? So this is pretty good. This is pretty important. He says to his disciples, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the other, other ends of the earth. Okay. So he's basically saying, start where you are, then go to, you know, Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then other almost, you got all that, right? Did you notice that when persecution came to the church, what happened? On, it says in, in the passage we read, verse 2, on that day a great perse persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, 
And all except the apostles were scattered throughout where? Judea and Samaria. So this, so what's happening is God is using this persecution to scatter his church, essentially causing them or forcing them or prompting them to do what he called them to do way back before the church began. In other words, this tells us God doesn't want us to remain in a holy huddle. He wants us to engage our world. He wants us to tell the world about the gospel. Now, what the early Christians did when they were persecuted is they went out and they began to share the gospel, and people started getting saved. Um, here's the point I want you to see. You were chosen for a purpose. God chose you and called you into his family for a reason, for a purpose. And it wasn't for yourself it wasn't to be alone with God or alone with Jesus, and it wasn't even to be within God's people and God's people alone. You were called to go into the world, to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and other most parts of the world. And what I find is many Christians have fallen in love with holy huddles. They want to be... There's a group of Christians that want to be separate from the world. And, and they basically say, we don't want anything to do with the world. We want to, you know, separate completely. And then there's other people that are so connected to the world that they have no witness at all. And what I found is Christians want to be separated. They, they want to have this separation. They want to, they, you know, and, and some people will say, well, pastor, it tells us in the Bible that we're not to be, uh, we're not to be in the world. We're not to be of the world, right? But here's the interesting thing. And Jesus, I think, walked this line better than anyone else. He actually walked that line of being in the world but not of the world. Now, again, I'm going to mention this, but the, the, the word, the Greek word that they use to translate in English to world is cosmos. And it can have a lot of different meanings. Sometimes it means people. Sometimes it means the planet. Sometimes it means the created world. Sometimes it means, and this is what I think he's talking about here, it means there's a force, there's a power, there's a, a negativity, there's a spiritual power and force that is anti-God. And that's kind of what he's talking about when he says, don't be in the world, don't be controlled by this powerful force that is running rampant in our world today. Don't be part of that. And here's what I think is going on within the church, sadly, too many of us are controlled by the world. We're in the world, but we're not, we're, we're not influencing the world. We're being influenced by the world. We're not being what we've called to be. Uh, we're called to engage our world with the truth of the gospel, not to isolate ourselves from the world. We're not called to isolate. And I know there are Christians out there that think, I want to isolate my kids. I want to isolate my family. I want to, you know, do all this stuff to keep them separate from the world. Scripture doesn't tell us to do that. Scripture says engage the world, but don't become part of this world system. Don't be influenced uh, by it. Don't let it squeeze you into its mold, Paul says in Romans chapter 12. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to do this alone. We do this together. We're part of a team. And it's time for the team to break the huddle. It's time for the team to say, I'm part of a team. I'm part of a group. But I'm part of a group that's reaching this community. We don't go alone. Jesus writes these words. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. How's that going? Because I feel as though, maybe you do too, that the church has lost its saltiness. And the church is losing its light. 
The world is looking at the church and saying, what do you, what do you, you to offer me? Well, how are you any different than me? Let me, let me come at it from this direction. Are you praying for a family member or a friend that lives in another community? And you're praying, God, I just pray that you would raise up some Christians, bring some Christians into their lives, help them connect with a church where, where your word is taught, where the gospel is preached. Help them to connect somehow through your church through your, through, through your people. You're, you're praying maybe for your grandkids, for your kids, for your parents, for your friends, for your siblings. You're praying for them when, that they'll have somebody will reach out to them. Well, let me ask you another question. Do you think somebody from somewhere else around the world is praying for family members that live in this tri-state area? Uh, absolutely I, I've actually met them over the years where we've had people where they'll come and they'll visit and they'll say, I've been praying for years that they would connect to a church. And all of a sudden, you know, you meet the people that have been praying. I was praying, I live out way out here, but I was praying for people, a church, somebody to reach out to my kids, my grandkids. And, and your, your church, your people reach, were the answer to my prayer. I mean, it's one thing to say, God, answer my prayer. Raise up somebody in that city to reach my friend, family member, the person I care about that I'm, my heart goes out for. It's another thing to say, God, help me to be that person for another person's prayer. The answer. Persecution came, and the first thing they did was not gather somewhere in safety in a holy huddle. They went out, and they began to share the gospel as God commanded them to do early on. And they began to turn the world upside down. We got to get out of the holy huddle, and we got to get into the game. That doesn't mean we stand down at a corner, we lift our Bibles up, and we have a sign that says, you're all going to hell or something like that, it basically comes to a place where we say, listen, I'm going to try to live the Christian life in, a, in a, such a positive way that, that when I do speak, it's because somebody asks me about my behavior and how I, I, how I use my words, how I treat other people, and they notice that there's an integrity, there's an honesty, there's something there that they don't have, and they ask why, and you say, it's because of Jesus, it's because of what Jesus has done in my life, and, 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 they, and they may come to a day where they also glorify your Father in heaven. That's what salt and light does. That's what the early church did, but it caused, it, it, it was persecution that brought that on. And, you know, some people say Christians have this view of persecution and it's, it's a bad thing. And it is a, kind of a bad thing, but as, in a sense, it was the persecution that God used to bring his, his church about. All right. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Look beyond the physical and see the spiritual. I believe, and I think the Bible teaches this clearly, that there is a physical world, but there is a spiritual world. There is a world that you can't, and they interact with each other. You can't see it, but you can see it, right? You, it's, you, you don't know it's there, but it's there. What do I mean by that? When I think of some of the things that I read and I see that is just flat out evil, there's only one way to explain that. And it's not genetics. There are evil forces, unseen forces, that are seeking to destroy everything that's good and godly, everything that God has designed, everything that God wants to make. They're, they're just as happening. You've seen it in the lives maybe in your own life, but in the lives of those around you. There, there are spiritual forces happening. The arguments you get in with your wife or your husband or your kids, there's a spiritual force that's agitating that. How many times have you gotten in an argument and when you kind of caught your breath and got back, you know, you, you got your, your mind back 
and you looked at what you said and you looked at what you did and you say, how in the world did I go there? Because there were spiritual forces egging you on and you listened and you joined them and you lost control. Saul was a young man and he was driven to destroy the early church in its infancy. He was going house to house. Uh, when he would find them, he dragged them from their homes and bring them before the Sanhedrin and he thought he was doing God's work. Um, and Paul it's interesting, Paul reflects on his B.C. life, his before Christ life. He, he, he says this about it in, in Acts chapter 22. He says, I persecuted the followers of the way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as a high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there uh, to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. In other words, Paul said, I didn't limit my, my, my persecution just to Jerusalem. I went to Damascus with letters from the Sanhedrin so that I could grab people from there and bring them back to be persecuted and prosecuted. He's a bad guy. And he knows it too. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I think this is an amazing passage. He says, I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul planted more churches than we, than, in the New Testament, he planted more churches than anyone else. Paul wrote probably a third or half of our New Testament. Can you imagine him laying his head down at night and thinking, what have I done? How could you use me? And by the way, let me just say this, whether you're watching online or whether you're live, if you, if you think that you've gone too far, that God could never forgive you, that there's no hope for you, I just want you to, I want to encourage you to, to look at the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul basically said, I am the least of the apostles because I persecuted the church. So Paul didn't just get over what he did. He basically saw how wretched and fallen he was. By the way, he was deluded in a sense that he thought he was doing the will of God. He was absolutely committed as Saul. He was committed to persecution and he saw everything he was doing that was pleasing to God, but he was absolutely wrong. In fact, we're going to see it as he comes to the road to Damascus. Jesus is going to meet him on a road, and he's going to say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he goes, what are you talking about? And Jesus basically told him, you're, you're going the wrong direction. Some of you may be going the wrong direction. You say, can I still turn? Yeah, you can. Saul did on the road to Damascus. Saul became Paul. And everything changed after that. What I'm saying to you is there's always hope. There's always a chance to turn. There's, you are never too gone. As long as you have a pulse and a heartbeat, you can always turn back to God. You can always turn to God. Let me ask you a question. Who's your real enemy? You already thought of somebody, right? You know, maybe two or three names popped in your head. Oh, yeah, the guy at work or this person or family member net sitting next to you. Don't look at them now. I mean, it's, it's inappro totally inappropriate. <laughs> but there are people, right, that they, they bug you. They know some people more than bug you. They are abrasive. They are abusive. They are harmful. They are hurtful. They are the enemy. That's the way we look at them, right? What I want you to see, though, look behind them and see that there is an enemy behind them. There is an, a spiritual force behind them that is controlling them. Saul thought he was doing God's work until Jesus met him on the road. There were spiritual forces influencing and pushing Paul 
And I just want you to see that no human being is your enemy. But there are forces and powers and principalities that are the enemy. And they are the enemy. And they can influence, they can energize, they can bring evil out in people. There are bad things can happen. And again, I know it's much, much more complex than that. But I want you to see that there is a time where Saul's can become Paul's. Some of you are Saul's. If you were to get up and share your testimony, people that know you go, or have met you, they go, no, you're just a nice, gentle, quiet person. No, that's not who I used to. That, that's who I am now, but if you knew me before, you wouldn't like me. I'm a different person now. See, there is somebody behind those people that you're struggling with that is energizing and is bringing the worst out. And they're slaves to it. The Bible says we were slaves, but now we've been set free. We were blind, but now we see. We couldn't hear, but now we hear. Our senses, our spiritual senses have been opened up. And I just want you to see when you approach the world today, because we have too many, and we have it on the surface level, we, we, we say, if you belong to this party, you're an enemy. No, you're not an enemy. We've got to stop looking at other people and saying they're the enemy. We have to see that there's things going on behind the scenes. There are, there are things happening that we can't see that are influencing. And so Paul, who, or Saul, who thought he was doing the work of God, was doing exactly the opposite. And then he came, I can't imagine that moment, that week, that month where he, he had this conversion and he turned from being Saul to Paul and all of a sudden now he sees, now he hears, now he understands and he must have been aghast at his life. But what he did see was that God was with him and God loved him. How do you think, do you think the early Christians prayed for Paul? How do you think they prayed for him? I, I thought of this, Lord, take him out. <laughs> Lord, smite him. Lord, send him to his eternal torment, you know? Well, I, I, you know, I, I don't think that's how they prayed for him. I don't think that's how they prayed for him at all. In fact, um, how would you approach Saul if you knew that he was going to become Paul? Your, your perspective would be different, wouldn't it? If you knew, you say, well, this is, this is Saul, but he's going to become this. And you'd have hope, right? You'd say, you know, anything's possible. And you would tell people, no, this isn't who he's going to be. He's going to be this. And you go, what have you been smoking? Are you crazy? He's, he's like terrible. I mean, when Barnabas brought him in before the first Christians, the Christians, I think, in the room go, yeah, why is he here? What are you doing? Are you crazy? He's the one. He's our nemesis. And Barnabas goes, no, not anymore. He's Paul. <laughs> you know? They go, well, it doesn't help me very much here, Right? Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5. He says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. By the way, this is what our pop culture says. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, please do not buy this. This is not what the Bible says. It's what our pop culture says. It's what our world says. But it's not what the Bible says. Notice Jesus said this. He says, you have heard it said, it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on evil and good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And by the way, when he talks about the tax collectors, not talking about the IRS, he's talking about a hated group of people like Matthew. Well, maybe they are hated. But anyway, that, the point is, he's talking about people who are kind of viewed as bad people. And he's saying, even the bad people do that. And then he goes on and he says that. And if you greet only your own people in your holy huddle, 
doesn't say holy huddle. What are you doing more than, than others? Do not even the pagans do that. He says, be, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, here, here's what you have to understand. We talk, we're talking about persecution. We're talking about dealing with bad people, evil people. And the Bible says two things that are very different than what we hear in our world. The Bible says that persecution is a part of the Christian life. It does. In John 15, Jesus says, if the world hates you, and again, the world there is not people. It, it's, it, it can be displayed through people, but it's really talking about the world system that's energizing the hatred in people. And he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, see there, that shows you he's not talking about people here. He's talking about a system. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Now, what we're saying here is we're called out of the world system, but we're called to remain in the world, but be not of the world. That's a hard balance to walk. You see, the point I want you to see is the Bible doesn't pr promise exclusion from persecution. In fact, it kind of promises it. It says, yeah, if you're going to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ, persecution is part of the way. The other thing it says is understand that any person that could, you may look at as, in, in a, in, as a Saul can potentially become a Paul. And so that should direct your prayers. And so there are spiritual forces behind the persecution of Christians. Um, there is an enemy who hates our Lord. The church father um, from North Africa, Tertullian, he was a church father and apologist, and he was addressing the Roman rulers. And, I, this, and I'm not sure of this. I know he said this, but I'm not sure of the context. I think it was at his execution. He said this, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust, to the dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. The seed is the blood of Christians. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says if you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to find persecution. The Bible says that when you see people who are evil and bad, pray for them. Instead of seeing them as Saul, see what they could be like as Paul. Our passage began with persecution, but it ends with proclamation. Persecution caused the early Christians to go out of their, get out of their holy huddles and get into the world with a, with a message. And they became, became little lights. They became preachers, teachers of the good news. And by the way, they weren't anything special. They didn't say, oh, let's wait till the apostles show up. No, they, they went with what they had. They shared what they knew. They weren't highly gifted. They were ordinary people. They were just following orders. And God was doing amazing things through them. Let me just say this as we close. There's a lot of debate today about what a mature Christian is. And some people say a mature Christian is somebody who knows the Bible or knows a lot of knowledge and information. Or some people say the, uh, a mature Christian is somebody who's been a Christian for a long time. I want to tell you that the, the level of maturity that you show is, is based upon this. How obedient are you to the word of God that you already know? So you've heard God's word today in different passages. And so the question is, if you are a mature Christian, whether you're here or you're watching, you're going to say, what is it, God, that you want me to do or change or fix or whatever? What is it? How am I to respond to the truth of your word today? And, and Jesus said over and over, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I've commanded. It's one thing to say, I know a lot about the Bible, I know, have a lot of information, I've been a Christian for a long time, but in the end, maturity is measured by obedience. The 
So do you need to get out of the holy huddle and into the game? Are you in the game or are you still in the huddle? Do you see people as the enemy or do you see them as pawns of the enemy? In other words, do you see them only as Saul with no potential of a Paul? Do you pray for them? And that's that's the question. Think of that person when I first asked you that question. When was the last time you prayed for them? And would it make a difference if you began today? So, folks, the early church got their world rocked. A guy named Saul came after them. We're going to see more about that. A guy named Saul comes after them, and they get out of their holy huddle, and they have to run for their lives. But as they run, they take the gospel with them, and they become salt and light, and the world is changed forever through them. They, they understood that Saul was, was a bad person, an evil person, somebody that wanted them to be dead. He, and, and they understood that, but they still prayed for him. And he became a Paul, who gave us a lot of the New Testament and planted many, many churches, spread the gospel all over the Roman world. So what is it that God wants you to take from the message today that will change your life and get you into the game? Stand with me and let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing your word Help us to get out of the holy huddle and get into the game. Help us to see people not as Saul, but as the Paul they could be. Help us to pray for them. Help us to change the way we we move as your church. That we would go as a royal priesthood, a chosen nation, those who are blessed by you. We are called, Father, to go out into the world and to bring the gospel. Help us to believe, Father, that the gospel has implications. That people are going to a Christless eternity in hell without Jesus as a Savior. And that you've called us to be the bearers, the heralders of this gospel message. Help us to pray for those who persecute us and are harsh and mean and evil. Because You see what they could be if they gave their hearts and lives to you. So use us, Father, in powerful ways to promote the gospel through our words, through our actions. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.